I don't know who put the schedule together for this talk, but the idea of putting an old guy from England just after uh, the, the, the right reverend here is a little bit frightening. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to be very boring now. By the way, I need to tell you that, uh, Stacy, my arthritis doctor is called Dr. Jenkins. So um, you, you, you're in good company. And Dr. Jenkins is, in my opinion, a, a really good name. My daughter's boyfriend is called Richard, and he has a doctorate. And so they tend to call him Doc Dick. Less good. I'm going to introduce you to Vitruvian quality. Isn't that exciting? First of all, thank you to all these nice people who are paying for my stay, um, paid for my flights, paid for all this to happen. Glad I'm going to make the best of it. So Vitruvian quality. I imagine a number of you are sort of thinking, Viti what? Um, some of you might think this has to do with Viti culture and that I'm going to bring out wine or something, but no such luck. Let me introduce you to Marcus Vitruvius Polio. Marcus Vitruvius Polio was born sometime before Christ, died sometime after the year 15 AD. He might not have been called Marcus Vitruvius Polio. We don't actually know. Um, there's a picture of him. Maybe he looked like that. But I looked for a few other pictures. Oh, yes, the only thing that he is recognized as having done officially is build the Basilica at Faino, which is here. Nothing remains of this Basilica, so nobody actually knows if it existed. This, this, is, this is my inspiration. This is, this is an extraordinary guy. He might have looked like this, but then when you look at some other pictures of him, he looks different. So we don't know what he looks like. We don't know when he was born. We don't know if the only bit of architecture he built actually exists. And we're not sure about his name because there's a number of varieties. What I am pretty confident about is that the Vitruvius who was in the Lego film did not look like him. Okay? But He was a master builder. He was an architect. As an architect, as a master builder, he had to be skilled in all these different things, architecture, management, engineering, chemical engineering, civil engineering. One thing we do know is that he designed this machine. This is his invention that we're fairly certain about. People have rebuilt it so to make sure that it works and that it's realistic. And some of you may have heard of a television program in which his creations were used. Okay, so anyone here ever heard of Game of Thrones? It's a little television program that didn't have much success. So we're pretty sure the man existed. Um, what we do know, and this is what becomes important, is he wrote a book about architecture. He wrote a book about architecture, 10 volumes, okay, serious. His idea was that you had to have all these pieces fitting together. So architecture is not just designing a fancy building. It means putting in all the things that belong to it. It means the sewers, the water supplies. It brings up um, town planning aspects. It brings up all kinds of things. And of course, it's 
some war machines thrown in because of Rome light war wars. This is an important book. This is an important book, and I'm going to wear this is an important book in the history of humanity. This is an important book, surprisingly, in the history of software engineering. We'll get to that. His book was rediscovered in the Renaissance and was a big influence on a number of key Italian Renaissance architects, the big ones. He is a recognized, acknowledged influence of Michelangelo, of uh, Da Vinci, of Alberti. These are the people who made architectural history at the time. Um, one of his basic principles was that every structure, I think every product, has to respect three characteristics. Those three characteristics are firmitatis, utilitatis, and venustatis. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it in Latin, but I'm doing my best. That means stability, utility, and beauty. Stability, utility, and beauty. More specifically, stability means your product, your structure, has to be stable, has to stand up storms, has to stand up when it is raining, when there's strong winds, all that. Your product, your structure, needs to be useful. It needs to provide some kind of value to the people who are using it. And number three, beauty, your product, your structure, your building has to be desirable. Now, those of you who have heard me speak before know that I only ever speak of one thing, and that's the need for quality. So coming back to these three terms, we tend to forget that the quality in what you are producing is critical. Especially at this time, um, we just saw a little bit about the justified or not obsession that the US security has with China for the moment. Maybe it's justified not, I'm not going to question that. When I am looking closer to home, in Europe, from Poland to England, from Sweden to Italy, I am seeing the rise of um, far-right movements. I am seeing isolationist movements. And in England, we're not obsessed with the Chinese. We're obsessed with those damn Romanians. Okay, because you guys are all coming over and at the same time you are stealing our jobs and living off our welfare without doing anything. I don't know how you do both at the same time other than perhaps that the English weren't doing anything to start with. Um, it is an obsession. As isolationist politics are rising throughout Europe, there is a question, why are you outsourcing your stuff to Romania when we have got good German engineers who could do it better? Or Dutch, or English, or whatever, okay? You need to provide the quality, which is why quality remains, has to remain your number one obsession in this industry. Anyway, coming back to my friend Vitruvius, Vitruvius had this principle that the structure, the proportions of a building, had to be brought down to the proportions of a human. Um, he described in great detail how the different parts of the human body, the male body, because apparently the female body doesn't have as good proportions as the male body. His opinion, not mine. I'm just the messenger. 
But apparently, the male body has these perfect proportions, which he described and said, this is the principle you have to follow when you are building a structure. Went into great details about what are the proportions of the male body, which became the inspiration for, among other, Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, who I'm sure you have already seen somewhere. I like the drawing. I like the drawing for a number of reasons. In the 1970s, someone rediscovered these principles. Someone rediscovered the principles promoted by Michelangelo da Vinci and Vitruvius before them, and wrote a book called The Pattern Language and the Timeless Way of Building. The books are normally the same color. The one that is faded is my personal copy. Um, the other one is taken from the internet. Just a screenshot from Amazon. That's why they look different. I'm afraid mine has aged slightly. He brings back the concept that everything needs to be designed back to human size. And he brings in the concept of a pattern. So when you go into these books, you find that he is describing in 253 different topics how to do architecture. At the top level, he is talking about the first pages. He's talking about where you should put towns, um, how the connection should be made between towns. And by the time we get to the end, he's talking about where you should be putting the flowers in your house. Okay? So he's got this whole channel of things. It's fascinating reading. He explains how these things fit together. He explains how it is important for them to fit together. Um, I've taken the explanation here from Wikipedia. It was easier than writing my own review of the book. But I want you to read again that first sentence. Alexander introduces the concept of, quantity wi of quality without a name and argues that we should seek to include this nameless quality in our buildings. He attempts to, to define the idea by surrounding it with existing concepts that reflect a part of the quality, but are not sufficient to define it. This book had an extraordinary influence on architecture and on software design. I'm assuming none of you have heard of this book or read this book, and yet you've done, you've studied software in university, and you've done all these wonderful things, and you've never heard of this seminal book. The idea went through to defining patterns in software. Do you, does anybody understand the concept of patterns in software? Okay, a few of the older ones, I guess. The idea of patterns in software was translated into this book in 1980-something, uh, 1994. 1994 created the book Patterns of Software, Reusable Object-Oriented Software. Okay, This was a new concept. It's something which you are so used to that you don't even recognize the pattern anymore, which is surprising, okay? We've got loads of patterns that you are using, reusable concepts, reusable structures that you are using, whatever your job is, whether it is at the design, the architecture level, or if you're just writing code. I'm sorry, not just writing code or if you are writing code, no just. Just want to remind you that the people writing code in your business are the only ones doing what your customer wants. Okay, that's all your clients are buying, it's code. Everyone else is just a nuisance. So we've got IT patterns, 
They're different concepts. There are loads of different patterns that are there. The basic idea is I want a system that is reusable, simple. It contains building blocks, and I can decompose a complex product into a series of relatively simple building blocks. I probably need to apologize to the photographer who's trying to focus on me. Um, the idea is to make it repeatable, predictable, and reliable. When I, when I started off in software development, um, once, w once we had got the dinosaurs out of the building, real dinosaurs, um, we were using these wonderful tools that you may have heard of, punched cards, paper tapes, reel-to-reel -reel tapes, line printers. I had a manager who insisted that our COBOL 68 programs may never be more than two pages long. Anybody here ever used COBOL 68? Okay. You know COBOL 68, you filled out probably 15 pages on a line printer before the program even starts. And it's a line printer, so you cannot reduce the font or use bigger paper. All this is standardized. It's the only way. What he was teaching was we need to use building blocks so that new programs are copy and paste, basically. Copy, call, include. This is very good in engineering. Was very useful. But my interest is quality. And the idea of quality, this has been completely forgotten. Just a few reminders from previous talks. Quality is not something you build into your product. Quality is the relationship that your client has with your product. Quality is whatever your client says it is. Quality is produced by people, not by process, not by technology. Quality is done by people. Processes and technology are there to help. And if people are going to produce quality, they need a level of happiness, of job satisfaction at work. And we have got all these lovely terms which don't tell me what quality is. Putting all this stuff in place this is your contractual obligation. If you sell me a piece of software that doesn't work, you haven't fulfilled your contract. If you sell me a car that doesn't have wheels, you haven't fulfilled your contract. This is the basics. When I look at these terms, these are the things you can put in place using pattern software engineering, and it covers firmitatis and utilitatis, but it misses out on the desirability of your product. You see, you've done a good product, but that's not quality. Quality is when I look at your product and I say, wow, I didn't expect that. Wow, that's really neat. That was much better than expected. And that is the quality with no name coming back to Vitruvius. And that is where I bring in Vitruvian quality. I've got a lot of words on the upcoming slides. Um, I'm not going to go through all of, well, I'm going to go through all the slides, but not through all the words. The concept of Vitruvian quality is a hierarchy of quality. It is bringing the quality down to this pattern level beyond just doing something that's defect free. So I've used Da Vinci's Little Man because it's full of interesting things and it allows me to talk about squaring the circle, which I'm assuming you all know is something that's long seen as impossible, but it, it works with the drawing. 
The idea is to set up a pattern of quality requirements, recommendations, building blocks that go from the long-term vision of your business down to your daily activity at human level. So, I've broken this down, the square are basic management concepts. These are things you should know how to do, you should be doing. No surprises there. The circle are more soft skills that are frequently forgotten when talking about quality and business management. We start with the vision. And I've put in a little quote of Vitruvius every time because it makes it more fun. If you're, if you're bored with what I'm talking about, you can read the quotes and try to figure out how this fits into what I'm talking about. But I thought there was a relationship every time. Number one thing is, what is the vision? What is the vision for your company? I am astounded at how many companies, even when I talk to the CEO, the managing director, cannot give me a clear vision statement. Why? would a prospect come to you in 5, 10, 15 years time and not to your competitor? What are you going to be known as? Why is your company going to be recognized as the one I want to go to first? That's the number one vision aspect. I don't care if you want to be the most zero, can you be most zero? Anyway, the most zero defect company in the world, you want to be the cheapest company in the world, you, you want to be the most reliable, whatever it is. I'm always asking senior management this question. There is one manager who one day told me that people would come to them because they're so good at firefighting. Okay? I wanted to hit him. Firefighting is the one thing you don't want to have enough experience to become good at. Firefighting should be something exceptional. What is the vision? The second vision that I want to see is if I talk to the staff and I ask them, why would you want to be working here in five, ten years' time, knowing you can earn more money somewhere else? What is it that keeps you here? Tell me about cutting edge technology. Tell me about work life balance, all these good things. We bring these two together in order to create the company vision. And this is the starting point of your quality concept. Underneath that, we have got the policies. The policies are the law. The policies are foundational. No one is above the policy. No one is above the law. You have to do this. The policy is a translation of the vision into basic attitudes, basic ways of thinking. The policy should stay in place for a long time. It's not dependent on technology. It's not dependent on people. It is the implementation of the vision in law. Strategy is how are we going to achieve this vision. This is all related now, okay? I've got my vision, I've got my policy, I've got my strategy telling me how to get there. If I apply the policy, follow the strategy, I should satisfy the vision at some point. They have to be related, they have to be aligned. And then we come down to process. After having spent 20 years selling process, I hate the word. Process is very simply your day-to-day -day work practices. It is understanding what you need to do. The process is the fulfillment of the policy. The process is aligned to the policy. The process is there to make it easier for you to respect the policy. And the process is then subject to technology, which allows the implementation of the process. So the technology is there with the process to support you people in respecting the policy. 
training. Didn't mention that the two previous ones were the legs because they support your business. This is the center of gravity of your business. Training. If you do not have training, you are out of date. Okay, there is technology is moving forward, things are happening. If you're not having sufficient, when I go into a company, when I go to an immature company with in my opinion, very little hope. And I talk to senior management about the training policy, and they tell me, well, everyone in the company is allowed up to five days of training per year. Okay, sorry, you failed. If I go into a mature company, and I ask the same question, and they say that everyone in the company is required to have a minimum of five days training per year, now I've got hope for the business, okay? The business has to move forwards. Training is critical to make it happen. It's the center of the company, okay? Someone out there, someone out there is about to come up with something new. I don't know what it is, I don't know who, I don't know where, but someone's about to come up with something new that makes your business completely redundant. You've just seen these wonderful demonstrations earlier on today um, in the two first keynotes. Loads of things are happening. Someone's about to kill off your business too. Training will help you continue. Continuous improvement. The moment you deploy your process, a training, anything like that, it is already wrong from day one. So we accept that, we understand how to improve it, we make some kind of progress in order to achieve the vision. Now we come to the circle. I am surprised how few people in engineering companies can tell me what is their role, not what is their title, but what is their role. What are you supposed to be doing? What is your responsibility? How much authority do you have on this? That's what is important. I'll be talking tomorrow about skills management. Basically, this is where it happens. Uh, years ago, there was a book published called The Mythical Man Month, which explained why software engineers were stupid to throw more people at bad projects. The project's running late, you're going over schedule. Here, take four more people and now you'll succeed. No, you won't. Four more people will slow you down. Understand the role's responsibility, work on the skills, make sure that the roles are identified based on the skills needed and the level of skill and competency of the individuals. Each one of you has a completely unique set of skills and competencies and aptitudes. That will allow you to identify the right role. Feedback. Again, this all has to work together. I will continue to argue in any company that an annual performance review is the most negative thing you can do. Okay, annual performance reviews are stupid, destructive ideas. The idea of the annual performance review is I'm going to go and talk to my manager and tell him everything I've done good over the past year and why I should be paid more money. My manager will tell me all the stupid mistakes I made over the past year and tell me why I'm lucky to still have a job. And then we'll discuss this for a few minutes and then we'll finally agree on the budget that was established several weeks before at management level, okay? It's just bullshit. It's, it's complete utter nonsense, it's destructive, it's demoralizing. I want feedback this week. I want feedback immediately. I want a weekly performance review. If you are a team leader, a project manager, you should be having a one-on-one -on -one review with all the people reporting to you 
on a regular basis, preferably on a weekly basis. It only takes 10 minutes. Culture. Culture of the company. Culture of the company, the culture is how people act when nobody's looking. Do you know what the culture of your teams and companies are? I'm talking to management level there. Or do you assume that when you're not there, they're acting the same way as they do when you are there? Because if you believe that, you're wrong. Okay. Um, I was in a company a few days ago where the CEO was very proud to tell me that uh, they sat in the middle of the open spline office with all the developers. And my first reaction was the developers must hate that. Get out of my face. Let me focus on my work and not having to behave. Communication. In my experience, in the uh, 43 years that I have been in business, I would estimate that approximately 99.98% of all companies complain about communication. There's not enough, there's too much, I don't know what's going on, I receive 700 emails every day, I don't know what's important. Okay, You need to manage communication. It is an art form. You need to identify how to get the knowledge available at the right moment. Communication down, communication up, communication sideways. Education. We do a lot of training in IT. We do very little education. Time to change that. Education is understanding why. It is understanding the relationship between things. It is understanding the interfaces between your activity and the rest of the world and how you are impacting things. You need to understand it. It is understanding the history of things and how they work together. Tasks and procedures. Come down to the low level, your daily activities. Your daily activities, the tasks that you are given on your project. We've got this whole structure of tasks. We've got work breakdown structures and life cycles and sprints and scrums and Kanban boards and all this stuff basically coming down to tell you this is your task for today. You need to understand how that task fits into the company culture, fits into the company strategy, helps to achieve the company vision. Every day, you need to remember that you focus on the company vision by performing your daily tasks. And that's basically Vitruvian quality. I am fleshing this out. A few years ago, I was pleased to uh, launch my book um, here, Orchestrated Knowledge. I launched it at IT Camp. I am hoping that next year I can do it again with Vitruvian quality. Uh, oh, and just one more slide. Just one more slide. And this fits into the whole culture aspect. And that is the fractal process. Okay. You've all you've all been to university. Everyone understands what fractals are, right? A lot of blank stares, okay. A few people that say, yeah, yeah, I know that. The idea of a fractal is that every component reproduces the bigger thing and it just goes on to infinity. Fractal process is because I believe when you are given a task at the beginning of the day and you have got a few hours to complete that task, that task is a project. And so you fit into the full picture of um, the, the quality concept by saying, this is the task I have to do, 
I need to spend time understanding the requirements, designing how I'm going to do it, planning the time I'm going to need, who do I need to speak to, etc. So you manage each individual task as a full project and record the time it took. Like that you can learn next time you have to estimate something. And that's about it. Um, I have got, uh, what, five minutes, something like that. If anybody wants to ask questions, I probably need to apologize for my sore throat. I seem to have been starting a cold, which means I'm not entirely sure my voice sounds natural right now. Any questions? No questions. Does anybody have any idea what the hell I've been talking about for 45 minutes? Oh, good, there is one. Good. <laughs> okay, so then I will leave you with this. Um, thank you. I am hanging around. I will be here for the rest of the conference somewhere, somewhere around. I've got a talk tomorrow afternoon at a completely different subject. And the panel, and the panel. I have persuaded, um, at great risk to my own life, the organizers of IT Camp to organize a panel tomorrow afternoon on the future of software development or the future of IT in Romania, because I have serious concerns at this point as to whether you have a future. And so um, I would very much like to discuss this with some very intelligent people in public and have an open discussion on the subject. And then there's a feedback form that you're supposed to fill in. I haven't actually seen the feedback form, so I don't know what you're supposed to do on it. Thank you.